，至少是这种这样的。然后，如果是要跟你分两面的话，就。我觉得不满的，就来打。然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然
the sum of the psi function evaluated at z from indices 1 to n and indices n and plus 1 to 2 n. It's going to bring the shadow sample and original sample. Is upper bounded by uh, psi tilde. So that's just like, it should be called as, I don't know, the psi tilde <laughs> definition. Uh, Subadditivity. Yeah, yeah. Like, don't cause this sub, sub additive. Uh, whatever, and uh, and the, the the final condition is the symmetric condition, which just says that uh, for whatever way you're taking a non-random sample, so that's lowercase uh, sequence of lengths two n, if you are taking a different ordering of that sequence, then the value of psi theta doesn't change. That was the symmetric condition, and under these conditions, you have an, another uniform bound there. So it's that the big theorem we are trying to shoot at would be of this type. So it's really very similar to uh, whatever we were proving for the final classes and also for the lower bracketing numbers. So in this case, the difference to those theorems, it's like a uniform one-sided deviation. The difference to those theorems is that you get the L1 uniform covering number bounds. Um, and so that's, that's all the struggle, that you are replacing the, the bracketing numbers with uh, the uniform L1 covering numbers. So and that's it. Uh, so this is uh, really analogous to what we had before for the finite case, then for the infinite case, with lower bracketing, with the half thing. And then you can have a similar inequality, and I didn't finish writing up all the gory details of that, uh, where you have a multiplicative bond. So the difference is that, OK, both of them bond uniformly over all uh, of the functions in G. Uh, and here you have a PG under the root, and of course you're gonna have a lower order term, some constant times the logs divided by N plus some epsilon then comes here, I don't know the constants, we will work that out. Uh, but one is of, of the multiplicative type, the other is the non-multiplicative type. That's what we are shooting at. Okay. Uh, and uh, so that demo is, is supposed to be useful for that. And, and there is a second demo that I actually wanted to write on a board. <laughs> so this is uh, demo two. That was the symmetrization demo, and this is demo three. Um, so we will have. Okay, this is where we have this uniform condition and non-uniform condition. So we're going to have uh, two functions, psi, very similar to the previous demo. I call them psi and psi prime. They take as arguments a function and then uh, an n-tuple from z and they return reals. And there is another uh, function map psi. So I'm overloading the notation of psi, but uh, that's okay. Based on the arguments, you can tell which psi we're talking about. And um, fixing two confidence constants and two, well, just just one uh, epsilon and we take a sample so now I'm going to drop this one to n and one to n here uh, but they come they have two n uh, components n here and there okay just last writing and we assume the following holds. So 
So there is a uniform condition which says that this property one minus that one for every function in your function class, psi tilde f set prime is upper bounded by uh, psi f z. And the other condition, the non-uniform condition, says that for every f, this property, one minus that the two, psi fz, no, psi f, is upper bounded by psi prime, fz prime, plus epsilon. And if this two hold, then the conclusion of the lemma is that the claim of the lemma is that this probability one minus delta one minus delta two, you, you can change these inequalities. <laughs> psi applied to phi is upper bounded by psi applied uh, to f and z plus epsilon. Right. Oh. This would be too weak, so it's a uniform bound. So the only challenge here is that one of the inequalities is non uniform, and so we have to deal with it. So, there are two sides. There are two functions. There are two what? Functions. Yes, yes, yes. So are they the same functions? What is psi? There is this psi and there is that psi, they are the same, they are overloaded notation. If psi takes a single argument, we are talking about this. If psi takes two arguments, we are talking about that. It's like in a function, uh, in a programming language, you can tell based on how many arguments it takes. There are no default arguments here, though. Okay? What's wrong? So take this discriminant function, QF, and Z. Okay, so Z is, is going to be an n topo. Um, and, and this is, uh, well, if you are reordering this, <laughs> you put everything on one side, what you want to prove. So Psi F minus Psi FZ minus epsilon. Okay. Define f hat to be the maximizer and pretend that this maximizer exists. Uh, doesn't exist, then you put an epsilon prime here and there, and you can work out that it still holds. Okay. So for simplicity, you assume that this, this exists. And then, um, define this even. <coughs> Is it argmax or max? It's an R max. Okay. You're picking the function that maximizes Q. And, uh, okay, but F hat has an argument that. Yeah, because this has an argument of Z, so the function that you're picking is going to depend on Z. Okay. V star, and V star. Huh? V star, V star. 
underscore Z might be better. There's a three Z. <laughs> Perhaps, I don't know. I don't know. It's just that clearly the argmax, the value of argmax depends on Z. And you, we need to think about the dependence. And this is just a notation to use to, to denote the dependence. So this is a map from Z to functions, right? Like the argmax is, is mapping, like, and then this is the value it takes. This is just the f hat map, maps uh, the topos, if you will. Right, okay. Uh, so let E be the event that for every f, q, f, and here I put in the random z, is less than or equal to, to zero. This is it, an even. If we prove that the complement around <coughs> this is less, uh, the probability of the complement is less than or equal to that one plus that of two, then we would be done. So big question mark. This is what we want to prove. Okay. What we want to prove that this probability one minus is that of uh, one minus that of two for every f this hot. That's equivalent to that this even the even E has a large probability or the complement has a small probability. Yeah? Uh, so it's basically we are using this f hat as the vehicle to, to achieve this. So clearly if you are on, on this even E, uh, then if you plug in f hat at z into the function q evaluated at z, then since for every function this value is smaller than or equal to zero, for f hat it's also smaller than or equal to zero. Okay. F hat is just a particle function. On the even E, for every function, this was true. Okay. So, it's also true that if you are on the complementary of the even, and you plug in Q hat FZ, that this cannot be smaller than or equal to zero. It has to be bigger than zero. Right? Because if it was smaller than or equal to zero, then for every function f, it would have it because this is a maximizer that you pick. Maximizer smaller than or equal to zero, then for every function, you get something smaller than or equal to zero. Okay, so now, uh, by condition U, which says that this probability of 1 minus delta 1, psi theta fz prime, or psi prime fz prime is uh, less than or equal to psi fz, because this holds for every f, it holds for the random f that we are also picking. It holds for f hat mm -hmm. at z. So we did uh, in detail this, uh, like how a uniform inequality converts into an inequality for uh, a function or like the argument that you're picking at random based on the sample. Uh, there uh, but there is this implication, right? So we have done that, so we can just use that. Um, okay. And uh, by this other condition, the non-uniform condition, okay, so this holds with property one minus that uh, one. Right? 
So this condition says that uh, there's this event on this event. For every function, you have this inequality hood. So on the same event, for f hat, the same inequality hood. That even has a probability of at least 1 minus f1. So the other condition says that, uh, and, and because z and uh, z prime are independent of each other, uh, with probability 1 minus delta 2, it holds that psi applied to f hat of z is smaller than equal to psi prime applied to f f hat of z and z prime plus f so on one hand we know that for every fixed function f, with probability there is an event uh, large, that has a large probability mass on which the psi of the function can be propounded by the psi prime, and we did that z prime plus epsilon. No, we are plugging in a random function, but that random function doesn't depend on like the randomness of z prime. The only randomness coming here in this inequality is from z prime. It depends on the randomness of z. And since z and z prime are independent, this inequality still holds. How do you prove this? Uh, that this holds with probability 1 minus delta 2, you can use a tar rule, right? So you can start to write the probability that this holds, and then you write it, oh, let's condition on z. If you condition on z, the condition on z this, this becomes deterministic, so now you can apply this other inequality, and uh, then uh, the Tarot takes care of it, right? Okay. So now if you put the two together, you can change the two together, and, and that it follows that with probability 1 minus that of 1, minus that of 2. Um, phi evaluated at f hat of z is smaller than equal to, okay, this plus epsilon, but this is propounded by that. So immediately writing the second one plus epsilon. And uh, so it follows that with probability 1 minus delta minus delta 2, uh, Q f hat, so this is equivalent to that, with probability 1 minus delta 1 minus delta 2, Q f hat z, z is more than equal to, to 0. And we see that bit, like these two guys are telling us that E is the same as the event that Q evaluated at F hat Z, Z is smaller than or equal to zero. Okay? So we concluded that the probability of this event is at least one minus delta one minus delta two and we are done. Oh, if, if you didn't have independence, uh, then I don't know how you would conclude that. Because here, what happens is that for every fixed f with probability 1 minus delta 2, you have this even hot, or this inequality hot. 
but not for a random f. And now we are trying to apply it to a random f. If you choose an incovariant f, which depends on z prime, maybe it's like, you know, minimizing this expression here. Like you choose the f that minimizes the expression. There's no guarantee that, you know, like the resulting f hat or like whatever random function you would get would still satisfy this inequality with high probability. For whatever we know, it might fail with probability one. But if f, the random function is picked on data that is independent of z prime, then you can use that. And, and to formally show that this inequality holds, you just have to use the Taha rule and use independence. That, that's why we used independence. Okay. So now we have all the ingredients to prove this theorem. Uh, so I'm going to, yeah, I can continue over there uh, with the proof. Uh, but what does this theorem say? So we're switching back to G for whatever reason. Uh, for the theorem, okay, like you have this G, a, a key condition here is that we're in a bounded case. So this is going to be used strongly. Uh, G takes values uh, in the zero interval, all, all the functions there, and then we want to conclude a uniform bound uh, on, uh, on this uh, set of functions uh, where we just use the uh, uniform empirical covering numbers. Okay. Uh, spell dot proof. What? So we're assuming the existence of the argmax. Yes, I, I said that we are assuming the existence of the argmax if the argmax doesn't exist. Then you would start, you know, like and uh, padding things with an epsilon prime, and then letting epsilon prime go to zero, and you would get the same design. Uh, I'm actually thinking, can, because we are paying a price of epsilon zero, can we do a? That's a different prime. epsilon. Okay. That epsilon was fixed. Like okay. here, there was an epsilon that was fixed. Uh, if the argmax doesn't exist, then you can approximate the argmax uh -huh. up to any accuracy epsilon prime. Yeah. And then that okay. epsilon prime appears in the inequality, but uh, no, for every zero. epsilon prime, you will get the same inequality, and then you say that, okay, like, you can let epsilon prime go to zero, okay. you still have the same inequality. So with all general generality, we can assume the existence of argmax. Right. Okay. I mean, like, in this sense, without the loss of charity, yeah. So there is no, yeah, like, the, the proof basically goes through without assuming that the argmax exists, yes. Why is that term called the shadow number? Uh, I don't know, like, you and your shadow are inseparable, and the sample is just always going to be there. I don't know. Good explanation. Someone invented it. It's, it's nice. I like it. Yeah. So here, okay, so we, we start to see the ingredients of like how the proof of the main result is going to go. Uh, so we have the symmetrization lemma, which was built around, you know, uh, the shadow sample and uh, this Rademacher vector, the random signs. Here we have this other other thingy. Uh, it is built around the, the shadow sample as well. And then, okay, we're gonna change these inequalities like <laughs> what we always do. Um, okay, so if you want to prove this is a uniform bond, uh, yeah. Sorry, just clarify one question. So the caliber of F that you're using to prove, since you're assuming the argmax exists, so the polygraph F is finite? No. No, it's not. No. Oh, okay. Thank you. 
nowhere in the proof we needed the, the okay. polygraphic analysis right. finally. Yeah. That would be just a, a, a condition that's sufficient to assure that the argmax exists, but it's not necessary. And as I said, the proof goes through even if the argmax doesn't exist, then you construct for a epsilon prime uh, and the f hat that depends on epsilon prime that goes epsilon prime close to the max and then you let epsilon prime go to zero at the end of the proof and like it just goes through okay yeah let's uh let's move on to the proof of the the main thing okay okay so you want to prove a uniform bond uh when you're proving a uniform bond and it's a big space, you do covering. Here we want to do epsilon uh, covers using the empirical uh, covers, the L1 empirical covers. So that, that's how the proof starts. Uh, and then you use, once you have a cover, then for the elements of the cover, you have the, the uniform bond, and you use a uniform bond for that. That's the origin of these logs, the n1 in the in, inside the logs. And uh, now we are going to need to do that in a in a careful way so that uh, nothing is messed up. And then that's where we are going to need the, the shadow sample. Okay. Here. Okay, so the big reason we took the <laughs> difference, the pain to, to call the f the g is because we are going to offset the functions of g by 0 0.5. And we do this to win a factor of 2 or 4. I don't exactly know, but <laughs> constants are super important. Okay, so we're going to cover f, not g. And, and this way we are winning a little bit, right? So G was in zero one. Because of that, F is the subset of minus zero point five to zero point five to the power of Z because we're offsetting at everything by zero point five. Okay. Uh, we're fixing the data. Fixing an epsilon, we take this sample and we take an independent sample, a shadow sample from the same distribution. We also take the random pair, random sine vector, which is independent of the samples that we got. And finally construct an album Z what um, cover. F. So F epsilon, the subset of F, and it's a cover of F with respect to the metric that is induced by Z1, Zn. That is the R1 metric. And uh, we, are, we are assured, like we are choosing a covering whose coordinate is less than n1. And n1 is like in the theorem, right? Like it's it's like this, the covering number of g. Uh, and with respect to the, the worst choice of the z. Okay. 
So the uniform coveting number definition was that, okay, like there's a coveting number definition for a fixed Z1N fixed sequence, it's like the minimum coordinate fixed set that creates a coveting with respect to the chosen metric. And if you take the worst case of that, over all possible sequences Z1 to Zn, that's the uniform covering number. That's going to be an upper bound on what we have here. We, we are always guaranteed to be able to find a cover with these properties. But its coordinate is not large. Okay. And uh, we're gonna need uh, a little lemma. And this is a, a really a beautiful little lemma. It says the following. You take a vector in Rn and you take a random sign vector. So this is a fixed vector, this is random. Then with probability one minus delta, it holds that if you take the inner product between the vector and the random sign, so take this inner product, you divide by n. So that's like the weighted average of the random signs where the weighting is given by these uh, coefficients a. Then this is upper bounded by two times the two norm of a squared of log one over data divided by n squared. So I, I might look weird that I'm dividing by n squared under the square root, I have my own reason. How does this work? Well, you have a uh, sub-Gaussian thing for the random or random variables, and then we learned about these lemmas that if you are summing independent sub-Gaussian random variables, how the sub-Gaussian changes, and you have concentration inequality for sub-Gaussian random variables uh, of this type, and then you just like chain all these results together and you get this thing. It's really simple. It's just applying sub-Gaussian, I think. Okay. We're gonna use this. Um, so I'm going to introduce this notation of f of n. This is just f applied to z1 and f applied to zn and the whole thing is collected into a vector of length n, okay? And here I don't care about whether this is a row vector or column vector. We're not doing any linear algebra, so it's just like a list. Okay, this is my fn. And um, so this little lemma implies that with probability one minus delta for every f in the covering. So I'm going to call this covering just For every F in the covering, uh, if you take the random sign average of F, it's upper bounded by a 
square root 2. So this, uh, the definition of this, what was it? It was the average of uh, take the random signs and evaluate f at those points. So this the location of this lambda, this is like the a vector. The a vector becomes fn. It's like f evaluated at all those points. Uh, so just plug in that. And then look, uh, because uh, this has at most n1, I, I can use a union bond with at most n1 elements, n1 over delta divided by n squared. So here there are two sources of randomness, the sigma and the z. If you fix the z, this inequality applies, but since z and sigma are independent, the whole thing still remains true. It's the same argument as what we used over there. So, okay. So what's the two norm squared of Fn? Well, uh, it's okay. So you can just upper bound that in a very crude fashion. Each value of f takes a value between minus one half and plus one half. You're squaring it. That's bound force. Uh, so the two norm squared of f n is n times, at most n times one force. So the whole thing is upper bounded by, my, my, multiplied by one force, so then cancel the two, two comes there, there is an n here, cancels one of the n's, and so you get uh, log n1 over delta divided by two n. Okay, so we have this result. So now fix some f from this function space. We can find f prime from this cover such that they are close in this empirical norm. Uh, so the distance in the, the empirical norm induced by the sample is at most epsilon. This was the meaning of the cover. Right? So the empirical cover with respect to some z1 to zn means that the average distance between the function values is, is less than or equal to epsilon. It's just Alvin and Briga cover. Okay, so this is the definition of uh, the cover. So now, um, P sigma n applied to f is of course the same thing as p sigma n applied to f prime plus p sigma n uh, applied to f minus f prime. So just adding and subtracting f prime. And this is upper bounded by 
phi sigma n f prime plus phi sigma n and okay not phi sigma n just p n applied to the absolute value difference between f and f prime so here there are some random signs if I choose the verse sign I get this and this was upper bounded by epsilon, so uh, the whole thing is upper bounded by p sigma n f prime plus epsilon. Okay. So now we're going to call the symmetrization lemma. And uh, in this application, we choose psi to be zero and psi tilde to be zero. It's super simple. Uh, so psi tilde is going to be symmetric. It's good. And the sum of the psi is upper bounded by psi tilde because zero is upper bounded by zero. Uh, and the uniform upper bound, in the uniform upper bound, uh, we have this p sigma and f, and then we want to choose this epsilon such that uh, that inequality holds. And uh, what do we have here? Uh, so p sigma and f is upper bounded by p sigma and f prime plus epsilon, and earlier we concluded that with probability one minus data, uh, for every f in the cover, and f prime is one of the elements in the cover, this inequality holds. So p sigma and f can be upper bounded this way, okay? So we know that with probability one minus uh, Delta P sigma N F is upper bounded by epsilon plus uh, so for for every F in uh, F epsilon sorry for every F in F. epsilon plus and uh, square root log n1 over delta divided by 2n okay so in the symmetrization lemma this is what we are going to call the epsilon inside the symmetrization lemma so the conditions of the symmetrization lemma are satisfied. So this probability one minus blah, blah, blah. This holds, those hold. Conclusion is going to hold. So the symmetrization lemma implies that Pn prime, sorry, this probability, and, and here I'm going to call this that one. This probability, ah, good. Uh, for every f p n prime applied to f less than equal to p n applied to f plus that's a big fat zero and two two times this quantity here so two times epsilon plus square root log n one over delta divided by two. Okay, so of course, 
this also holds for every element of G because G is just offsetted by 0 0.5. It's the same as F. So I can replace this by just saying G. Right? So F is, every F is just like G minus 0 0.5. It was two of them, so they cancel out. Uh, okay. And we also know that uh, if we fix any G, then by hoping, this probability one minus that to two, e G is less than or equal to P n prime G plus square root log one over delta two divided by two n. So now we will use lemma two. and change these inequalities to get the result we wanted. So on one hand, we have this. So that's the same as condition U here. Uh, that is, this is Psi prime applied to G and uh, Z prime. So this is a pi psi prime. This is my psi. This psi thing um, okay, so this is going to go to the end and uh, the psi of F is just P applied to G and the psi prime is, is the same, right? Uh, okay, so I, I need to choose psi prime to be this. Okay, so I choose psi prime to be this, and then the first inequality, uh, add to the first inequality this quantity, then uh, that condition is satisfied where psi is becoming this expression plus this expression. So, writing it down, uh, number two implies that this property or minus that, or minus that, the two. Um, PG is upper bounded by uh, PNG plus two epsilon plus square root log, and one over that uh, divided by two n plus um, square root log one over this is delta one and this is delta two over two n. Okay, and then choose uh, I don't know that two to be. 2n plus 1 over, ah, choose that divided by 2n plus 1, that 1, is that a minus that 2, so that they sum to that, and uh, it follows that one over delta two is two n plus one over delta. It happens because I, I choose it so that delta one over n one is also delta over two n plus one. So these two terms are really the same. You sum up everything, then you have a two epsilon there, and then you have three times this square root guy, and that's the origin of the three over there, and that's why you have two n plus one uh, plus one 
in the log, and that kind of is by fitting because uh, we usually want in the union bonds we want to have uh, in the log we want to have how many inequalities we used uh, in the proof, and in this case we were using uh, where is the two coming from? Should be just Mpops from this one? Maybe it should be just an F. I don't know. Did I mess up? Anyways, you buy the terms, something comes up. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on N bond in a linear fashion. Red white. Why is it a two? Did I do it? I think this just works, right? So what's that one? It's uh, that one. So that's one plus one. Plus one. Work and plus one. Plus one. And uh, so one over that or two is n plus one over that. That's good. M plus one over delta one. That cancels the N one. So it's like there is no two. I don't know why there is a two over there. I think that you would only have a two if you wanted two sided inequalities. And it's fine. Maybe you have a two. But then I, I don't know. You should have two times N plus one. Like the, the plus one should be two as well. Anyways. Okay. So why do we shift g by 0.5? If we didn't shift uh, g by 0.5, the calculation here would give what? Just a constant. Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. It has to be zero name. Uh, uh, it's okay. like, okay. is it? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, this makes no sense. No, no, it's like here we have n over 4, uh -huh. and then we would have n. So there's like a factor of 4 difference under the square root. Wow. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> right? So then you would have this highly suboptimal constant. Here you would have a 2, and not dividing by 2. Can't bad that feeling. Yeah, this is uh, winning a constant. It's like a big win. If you can do it, you do it. And it's just from shifting a constant amount, you don't really have to do much to get that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. It just, yeah, better constants, sometimes. But it's not really changing anything, right? You're showing this for the shifted thing. If you show it for the original, this yeah. will still be there. Yes, it, it just said, in the proof, at some point, we use some inequalities, and at that point, when you use the inequalities, you want to get the tightest possible constant and for that you appreciate things. Okay. Also, like, just uh, for making sure, like, by lemma team can move the for all G, like, swap the order of for all G and with probability, so that should be. What? Okay. What, what do you mean? So originally right. we fix a G, then we get that for, uh, in a theorem statement, statement one, you have with probably one minus delta for all G, so uh, that's why I'm not here. Yeah, this is what we got at the end. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying that I, I just to write here for all G? Uh, kind of. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, otherwise, like, it's a big statement. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So we inherited that from uh, from here, right? You had the uniform bond, and then in lemma two for one of the inequalities, you have the uniform bond for the other. This is the Hofding. <coughs> then you ch just change. That's like a standard proof that we always did, and now it looks a little bit more complicated because of these two lemmas. Uh, but but the steps are pretty close to what we were doing, except that. There was this Rollerwalker business, so the random sign vectors, and then it was pretty crucial, so that, because we want to use the Andrika covering at the sample. So 
And now that would be highly problematic if you only had one sample. So you introduce this shadow sample, and with that you can use the empirical covering. So that was happening here. So in this, the application of this lemma, like these are random functions, they depend on the sample. Then why would this hold for every f in this random thing? But it only holds because here you are randomizing with the signs, so that's how you save yourself. But you actually never wanted to talk about the random signs, so then you go back and create a shadow sample. And then uh, you use the symmetrization lemma to relate the empirical means uh, with respect to the random signs to the shadow sample means. Once you have the shadow sample means, you have to go back. That's where lemma two comes in. And in lemma two, you go back by just applying health data. It's uh, okay, so also it is good to, to remind ourselves that the reason we are doing this, all this business, is because for, uh, for classification problems uh, with this uh, geometry classes, uh, the zero one loss is very inconvenient. It's a non smooth loss, so the typical covering arguments that we normally would want to use will not work. You have to somehow do something else. So one of the things that people noticed is going to work is this empirical covering. If you do the empirical covering, then, then you can, so the number of behaviors uh, that a simple function class can exhibit on a sample grows slowly because the function class was simple. It still grows with n, so that's why like you have an n dependence, like the uniform covering numbers are going to be n dependent. So if you, for example, work it out for the linear uh, classifiers, then uh, the number of, so this, this covering number behaves like n to the power of d. So the log of that is going to be d log n. And so in these bonds, you don't get like square root d over n, you get square root d log n over n. So you kind of have this log n, and uh, you might think that, okay, like maybe it was suboptimal to do these coverings this way. Uh, and actually, no matter what you do in these coverings, you will have some n dependence. But with some better techniques, you can get rid of this log n. We are not going to do that, but uh, people worked really hard and got rid of the log n. But there you have to use not L1, but L2, and then some complicated argument, or like, uh, we are gonna learn about that argument, but this specific case we're not gonna cover. Um, and then you can remove the log n. Okay, so the other type of inequality is the multiplicative inequality. And, uh, yeah, let's see whether I can get to the end of that. Uh, how much, how many pages do I have left? It's only two. Right. Should be easy. Okay. You want to take a break? Then we have like 10 minutes to cover more than that. Yeah. It's not so bad. Let's go. I mean, let's do it. Uh, <laughs> Thanks very much. Our climbing's coming here. Okay.
So we're going to focus on this, and we figure out what caused us to ride there. It's going to be fun. And now we're going to see some more use of these two lemmas and like a less trivial use of the symmetrization lemma where psi was just and psi tilde was zero. So in this case, uh, so the whole thing was set up in such a way that you can also do the multiplicative bound with it. So that's why it looks a bit more complicated than it should be. Than it really is for the no multiplicative case. All right, so part two. Proof of part two. Uh, we choose F to be G. Yay, no offset. We choose F epsilon as before. It's just the L1, Z1, and epsilon cover uh, with the, the set coordinate so F epsilon, Z1, and smaller than equal to N1. And uh, so I just got rid of that inequality, but uh, as before, we have that for every F, in F epsilon Z1N, uh, sorry, this probability one minus delta, it holds that for every F in this random cover, uh, the random empirical mean sine perturbations is upper bounded by, and we didn't shift, look at this. So I'm going to write Fn norm squared log n1 over delta divided by n squared. So now fix f because we have this random cover that exists in f prime. It's the same step as before. Uh, except that we're going to do this. So we had this inequality before, right? Because you, you subtract two sides and then you can upper bound it with the empirical indifferences plus uh, empirical, uh, like the average across the sample of the absolute value function value differences, which is upper bounded by epsilon. Um, so, it follows from, from these two things that uh, this probability one minus delta for every f in f 
P sigma n f is smaller than or equal to uh, well this thing upper bounded by this plus epsilon. So I, I write the epsilon first and to and here I need to apply this to f prime, f prime n to norm log n1 over delta over n squared. Okay? And of course, uh, I can run this and I can create, okay, fn prime, what is fn prime? It's uh, fn was defined as f applied to z1 to zn, this vector, fn prime is f applied to the shadow sample. And I'm going to need uh, the concatenation of these two guys. Okay, how do I call it? I don't know. Uh, call it F tilde n. This is just Fn and Fn prime put together. A vector of lengths to n. So I can, so this, I, if I add these other components here, then I get something bigger. So I, I'm just ruining this inequality. So now, so I want to apply the symmetrization lemma. Wait, 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 this is, this is uh, very confusing. There is an F prime coming from here, and there is an F prime because of the shadow lemma, so that, that's not good, or the shadow sample, uh, that's not good. So here, <laughs> okay, let's go back here. Uh, so for every F, we can find this F prime, and then to this f prime, we are applying this inequality. Then we get f prime evaluated at those samples. So this is uh, this was this. Okay. So this is still. Um, on the sample z one to z n. Then I didn't do this, forget it. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's gonna be good. Uh, okay, so I want to use the symmetrization lemma, and this is going to be psi f z one n. So it's kind of complicated. You have to base an f, you choose an f prime, and then but like it still works. So that's our psi. The epsilon is the epsilon, and then we want Okay, a psi theta, 
such that if you add the psi for the sample and the shadow sample, then the psi tilde is after bonding it, and the psi tilde should be should have these symmetric properties. So we're gonna choose for psi tilde. to be two times square root and then here ah okay this notation is going to kill me so so this f has to be indexed f prime has to be indexed with the the, the sample because otherwise uh -huh. It doesn't work. And then I have to take just its values at Z1n. So OK, I can do that. And then now I can do the same with the shadow sample. Oh. And then instead of this notation, because the shadow sample becomes really important, I'm just going to say that I await this at Z1n. So no, the notation is not, not this, like not F subindex N means uh, awaiting, but F subindex Z1n means this, this vector that I, I look at F just through the sample. Like, and I, I just create this vector. Okay. So here, I can take these guys, two norm squared, nothing else changes. Okay. So this is going to be my psi theorem. Huh? I know we have to verify that the conditions are met. Um, so, this inequality is going to be met because I introduced that factor of two. And it's like, okay, you would have this guy and the same guy where you replace this Z1n both places with Z1 and prime, okay? So you have square root of, of this two norm squared, the other square root, two norm squared. You want to upper bound that by the square root of the norm squared inside the square root. You introduce a sufficiently big constant like two, and you get the inequality, okay? It's just like one of those quality things. Yeah. Tilde, is that should be f prime or f? There's no f prime here. f prime is the notation that you are given an f, you're picking an element of the coverage. So that's a function of f. It's like f decorated. Everything depends on f. Okay. okay. Is this function well defined? Because this cover f prime may not be unique. It doesn't matter. So you just pick one. Okay. Yes. I don't really understand what's in the two norm, like what that means. I'm just confused with all the subscripts and stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's like this is an n tuple, this is another n tuple. Oh. And you could just call cut the two. You oh, get a two n tuple. I get it. Okay. Right, the, the branch shouldn't be there. The prime needs to be there. The prime is in the F. What? What? In the F. In the F, yeah, it has to be there. But you're defining the function for, our, for an arbitrary F. Yeah, but like, so here, like, the inequality no, no, that no, we no. were getting was for the F prime. So it's like, I can't help it. I, I wish it was not there. No, when you're defining psi prime, psi tilde, yeah. that's a function of F. Yes. Not F prime. Yeah, but like, this is a function of F. This is what I was explaining. So these are all that are defined. As a function of f, you choose f prime based on this sample. Okay. 
which is energy f prime based on this sample. I'm not writing it as a function of f, but like it is a function of f. So it's value fine. Okay. Great. Oh, this credit goes all the way. So this is just based on this very complicated thing that like Yeah. So that's why the psi f z plus psi f z prime is a proponent by psi theta f z z prime. I hope this is Okay, uh, and psi theta is symmetric, yeah? I mean, like, through the z, like, if you are, is it? Well, it is not. Okay, you know what? This proof is collapsing. Okay, so I have to do, I have to get rid of the prime here. Okay. Well, uh, I can get rid of the prime. So why is I'm over time, but uh, oh, what's the problem here? Well, the proof is collapsing because uh, I wanted psi theta to be symmetric function. Uh -huh. If you're swapping the z's, nothing should change. And here, based on the z's, I'm choosing uh, an element of the cover. Oh, I see. So I need to get rid of the choice of the element of the cover go back to F. So my plan, okay, so I'm not going to do it, but my plan would be to upper bound this term here by just a function of the similar term with F at the price of introducing an epsilon here and then move that epsilon over there or like, you know, it's just garbage epsilon somewhere. Uh, carry it with you and know you have an F here I know everything here is going to go through. It's just that you're paying some price. Yeah. Why, why do you need to have, uh, wait, for F prime subscript Z1 N, and then F prime subscript Z prime, like can't you have the same Zs? Like why do you need Z and Z prime for those? I didn't need those, but I want to use a symmetrization lemma. So, in the previous proof, okay. Oh, sorry, so, but I mean like, if you have f prime z to be the same, but your argument are z1 n prime, and z1 n, then isn't it still uh, right, right. symmetric? It's, the problem is that here, you need to sum the psi, evaluated at f and z, mm -hmm. and f at z prime. So oh, it's from Z prime, I inherit this choice, and it's like I have no choice. I have to propagate it there. I see. So that's, that's the problem. I okay. See, see. So that is the plan. Maybe it's a homework for me. Uh, can, can we just stick to the above P sigma and F less than or equal to the square root without the F sign? What? Which? Which? What? Uh, yeah, this one. This one? Yeah. I mean, like the problem is that you have the F primes here. Like these are elements of the cover. Oh, okay. You have the inequality for the elements of the cover. You don't have the inequality uh -huh. for the functions. If you want to have the inequality for the functions, then you have to kind of like reverse what you were doing with the cover. At the sample they are close to each other, it's not a big problem, right? Like we already know that they are close to each other in Alvanor. The add to norm is just bigger. Okay, so it's gonna work. Right? No, it's like the values, I guess like you, you will need to rely on that the values are between zero and one, and if you're squaring things, 
then you're making seams smaller, so you can undo the squaring. Now you have the AVA norm. Now you can upper bound everything, but you lost the add to norm. Uh, but it's okay because the rest of the proof doesn't really use the uh, add to norm that much. Uh, maybe lose a constant here and there. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Nine. Sorry about this. It's like doing real stuff, real time. Getting into trouble. Yeah. Okay, we can fix this. All right. That's it.